of the policy has been escalating violence. But President Calderon's right-hand man, his Minister for Public Security, is convinced challenging organized crime will pay off over time. There is always a peak of violence at first. But in every previous case, in New York, Chicago, Palermo, Medellin, the violence began to go down after four to five years. Yes, it's a difficult time and uh, many people have died. Uh, but this is a period that uh, really uh, marks a turning point and history is unkind uh, when you get to a turning point, you fail to turn. The US government says Mexico has finally begun to tackle corruption at the highest levels. The head of Interpol in Mexico and a top government anti-drug advisor have been arrested. Both of them accused of taking money from the drug cartels. But those who refuse to take bribes have more to fear than prison. Plata or plomo, say Mexicans, silver or lead. Those who can't be bought with money are eliminated with bullets. Hundreds of honest policemen, soldiers, judges and their families have been butchered for saying no to the drug lords. As long as men like Chapo Guzman can walk free, many Mexicans feel their government is hopelessly compromised. Ciudad Juarez, a desert city on the border with Texas. This is the ultimate trading post between Mexico and the United States. It's also the jewel in the crown of Mexico's drug trafficking. Chapo Guzman is fighting to rule here too. The result is hell on earth. Two and a half thousand people were executed in Ciudad Juarez last year. Today, this is the most murderous city on earth. The drug war in Juarez has thrown up an unlikely hero. A softly spoken law professor, José Reyes was elected mayor two years ago. Ever since, he's been on a mission to win people's trust. Um, Reyes, I'm Cassie Adler from the BBC. How are you? Nice, Good. To, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Too. As soon as he took office, the mayor discovered that corruption was endemic in the local police force. The operational chief of the police that was there before I came in was stopped going into the United States with a ton of marijuana. He was, he was the number two guy in the police department, and he was stopped uh, crossing a ton of marijuana himself. Immediately, right the day I came in, I fired all of the heads. Everybody who's the head of the uh, police department was out that day. Half the Juarez police force was found to be corrupt and dismissed. Dozens of city officials involved in the purge were murdered in retaliation the mayor's life remains under threat. And some of the killings were done by police officers. Uh, imagine half of the police department being involved in, in something like that. With only 800 officers left, the mayor launched a huge recruitment drive to give Juarez a new police force free from corruption. I wanted to meet one of the mayor's police cadets, but not many were prepared to be interviewed on camera. Eventually, we found one brave enough to do so. Oh, wow. Como Charlie's Angels. No? <laughs> yes. Blanca del Rio is a young mother of three. No, no tengo miedo. Me lo pregunta mi mamá. ¿Tienes miedo? Y así como se lo contesta usted, ahí sí se lo contesta ella. No, no tengo miedo. No es corrompirnos o no ser corruptos. Esa es nuestra meta, llegar a ser unos buenos policías. 
Blanca's father was also a policeman. He was murdered on duty 20 years ago, leaving her mother alone with nine children. Christian knows far more about the dangers of Juarez than any six-year-old should. When his father opened a new shop, the cartels demanded protection money. Entonces a él le pidieron cierta cantidad, no la pudo reunir y al momento que la reunió, pues ya se le había vencido el plazo, fue por eso que de hecho el niño estaba ahí con él cuando pasó eso, se lo había llevado una semana. Blanca's husband was murdered in front of their son Christian. It happened only two months ago. While Blanca and the other new police cadets complete their training, the streets of Juarez are patrolled by federal forces, sent in by President Calderón. I joined them for an afternoon patrol. Where is it? There, there, in front. We don't cross there. Apparently the execution took place in, inside that petrol station. You can see inside the police cars on the, on the crime scene they've got masks on because for them it's a matter of life and death and, you know, people recognise them, the wrong people know where they are. That can cost them their lives or, or put their families' lives in danger. A man has been shot in the centre of town, in broad daylight. There should be plenty of witnesses. But people here rarely talk to the police. I keep thinking what it must be like to, to live in Juarez and know the danger you run of being in the wrong place at the wrong time every single day on one of those buses, walking out with your kid from school. And one of those gunmen just come past and spray the roads to attack one of their enemies. But, you know, you can just get in the firing line. Soon, our patrol receives another call. There's police and soldiers all around the car, bullet holes all through the windscreen and blood spattered all over the windscreen. The music is still playing in the car. In this scene of horror, absolute horror. These young men were all wearing similar badges. They were probably factory workers going home after their shift. It's hard to believe that each one of them was an intended target. And that this is a war with no innocent victims. What just makes this whole scene so surreal is, you, you know, you've, you've got this horror scene. And just over there, so close by, that's the United States over that fence. You've got US custom officials looking on at the mess that Mexico's in. This is one of the bridges crossing from Juarez into El Paso, Texas. To 
ordinary Mexicans, it symbolizes the chance of a better life. To Chapo Guzman and other drug traffickers, it's a prized gateway to their business of death. Across the border from Mexico is the world's largest consumer of drugs, America. Where have you found drugs and cars that have I mean, been inspected? It would, be, it would probably be a safer question for you to ask, where haven't we found drugs? Uh, your, your fender panels, your door panels, your roof, very drive shaft. We found it in uh, intake manifolds on the engines, air cleaners, in the tires. So where we haven't found it, I think maybe where you put the key in the ignition. How many drugs have you seized? This year, unofficially right now, we're, we're over 60 tons of that marijuana. You, that you seized right here? That's the total for, for the port. I don't have my uh, cocaine and heroin numbers, but it's, it's quite a bit, significantly less than that. And some methamphetamines and, and again, some pills. Cocaine consumption in the United States from the 1980s is down uh, almost 20, uh, more than 20 percent. But clearly, uh, one of the changes has been that uh, marijuana is the uh, chief uh, revenue generator. Prohibition is what makes marijuana so valuable. Many argue legalization would halve the Mexican cartel's profits overnight. For the American government, that's not an option. Legalization is, is not for uh, us a, a, an answer. Uh, it, it, it amounts to uh, throwing up our hands and conceding that uh, nothing can be done about that. The United States says it's helping Mexico with enhanced border cooperation and intelligence. It's also pledged $1.4 billion in aid. The two countries share a 2,000-mile border. There's fears the violence could spread into America. Yet less than a mile from deadly Ciudad Juarez, El Paso, Texas, remains one of the safest cities in the US. It's also one of the best armed. Whereas in Mexico, gun ownership is illegal, here in the United States, it's a right enshrined in law. Weapons are easily available in shops and gun shows across the country. That's a Russian Moise Gayan. Have you seen Enemy at the Gates, the movie? That's the gun. How much? How much? Uh, 395. I'll tell you what, if you buy the ammo for 390, I'll throw in the gun. All you have to do is look at Mexico. When people criticize our nation for our, our views on guns, look at Mexico and they're all enslaved and none of them have guns. But couldn't you say that in Mexico, because there are so many illegal weapons flushing about, that's, that's what's... But the illegal weapons, the but so the illegal, no, the illegal weapons yeah. are in the hands of criminals, not us. Every time they pass a law, it hurts law-abiding people. It doesn't hurt criminals. Criminals don't care. To buy a gun from a licensed dealer in the US, you need a background check. But once the weapon is legally purchased, its owner can resell it, lose it, or simply give it to someone without having to declare anything. Mexican criminals exploit this and use frontmen to buy weapons on their behalf. Preventing guns from falling into the wrong hands is a tall order. We went to meet the US agents who try to do just that. A number of firearms that have either been uh, seized as evidence, seized for forfeiture, abandoned, that we've come across in, in many different cases, many different ways. So when you see sort of multiple homicides in places like Ciudad Juarez, this is the kind of weapon that's going to be used? This, this will be one of them. Also, uh, you may have, uh, this is probably one of the most popular firearms that's seized in Mexico what is it? by organized crime. This is an AK-47. When weapons like this are seized in Mexico, their serial number is sent to the US for further investigation. How many of those traced firearms found inside Mexico are coming from the United States? Uh, well, I believe the statistic right now is right at about 90%. 90% of the thousands of traced weapons linked to Mexican drug cartels come from the US in all shapes and sizes. This was the big ticket item, was a 50 caliber rifle. Now, a 50 caliber rifle.